minor tragedy. I lost my uh, dongle for my clicker, um, so I'm a little bit late, but uh, let's get started. Welcome. Today we're going to dig into Active Record uh, with a couple detours. Um, uh, in the lower right, there's a link to the slides if you want to follow along. If you have press P, you can see some presenter notes, and if I actually get some links and notes that I won't cover in the talk. Uh, my Twitter handle's in the lower left corner. Feel free to tweet at me or about me, and use the hashtag RailsConf. Um, so, we'll focus on some major issues with Active Record. We'll look at some alternatives, uh, but then we'll talk about why you might not want to use those alternatives. And then we'll talk about a potential solution and a pattern that I think we should all be using. Who, who here uses Active Record? <laughs> okay, most of us. Who hasn't used Active Record? All right, I don't see any hands for that. Um, who's used a different Ruby ORM? A uh, couple hands. How about a, a non-Ruby ORM in a different language? A uh, couple more hands. Um, who loves Active Record? Uh, a few hands. Uh, who hates Active Record? Um, anyone else have a love-hate relationship like I do? All right. Actually, more more with that. Um, so Active Record is the 800-pound gorilla, and odds are, if you're going to work on Rails, if you get hired to work on Rails, you're going to be using Active Record. Uh, first, I want to make sure that everyone knows what an ORM is. Um, so Ruby deals with objects, obviously, uh, and SQL databases deal with relations. It's actually something called relational algebra that they work with. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure there's any mathematical foundations for, for no SQL databases. Um, so an ORM brings these two sides together. It maps between objects and relations. Uh, note that there's an impedance mismatch between the two sides. What works well on one side might not work well on the other side. Um, so some str data structures can't be mapped one to one. One of the canon canonical examples of this is a tree structure. Really easy to do in OOP, um, but there's several different ways to do it in relational algebra, and it's difficult to map between those two different ways. Um, I gave a talk at RubyConf 2015 where I uh, dove more in depth into what an ORM is, uh, sort of found the essence by building one in 400 lines. So Rails Active Record is based on the Active Record pattern. Uh, here's Martin Fowler's definition. I'm not sure if he's the first one to come up with it, but he did document it in the uh, patterns of enterprise application architecture. Note that he lists three separate things here. Uh, wrapping a database, pa database table, encapsulating database access, and adding domain logic. Now, you can argue that wrapping and encapsulating are pretty much the same thing, but domain logic is clearly a separate concern. Having that and in there is an indication that we might be violating the single responsibility principle, SRP. So here's an, a UML user diagram, or class diagram, of the active record pattern. Note that there are th two different kinds of things going on. Find and save deal with persistent storage. They're above that line. And below that line, we have name, age, and address that deal with domain logic. Um, the biggest problem with Active Record I have that it, is, it encourages bad engineering pro, uh, habits, mostly because it violates the single responsibility principle. It commingles that persistence and that domain logic. Um, separation of concerns is important. Just like Rails separates the MVC, model, view, controller, into separate concerns. We should probably be doing that with the model itself. And as your project gets bigger, Active Record's flaws become more apparent. I find it at about 12 to 20 model classes, it starts to hurt. Whereas if you're below that, it probably doesn't really matter to you. Um, Active Record is big. It's about 40% of Rails. And that size is another symptom of the single responsibility principle possibly being violated tries to do too much in one place, and it conflates those multiple concerns. Um, so 
I'm showing some stats here um, from Rails 5.23 mo model with one field. Um, and that came into over 100 instance methods and 600 class methods. For comparison, object has 86 methods itself, um, but string and array have about 250 methods. Um, so the number of instances is pretty bad. You're not gonna remember most of those, or a lot of those. Uh, and granted, some of those are dynamic. You're gonna know that if it has a field, it's gonna have a few things related to that. But there's a lot of things going on. Uh, the number of uh, class methods is really bad. Um, so class methods have um, several issues, which, oop, which I think I will cover later. Um, all right, so the other thing I find super frustrating about Active Record is uh, relationships or associations are defined in the model, like your has many and it belongs to, um, but attributes are defined in the database schema. I think that's a terrible abuse of the drive principle. Drive says there should be only one place to look for any piece of info. I feel like attributes and relations are a similar kind of thing that you should look in one place for. Um, and the clue is I often want to see them at the same time. But putting those related things in different places seems really counter to the, to the dry guidance. Um, so you have to look in two places for all the details about a model. Uh, this is a case where there's too much magic for me. Uh, there's some workarounds. Uh, there's a model annotations gem. Uh, there is an atom package to show, toggle showing the model's attributes uh, from the schema. But unfortunately, that's kind of broken for me. Um, so attributes API actually came out in 4.2, but it wasn't publicized into uh, Rails 5. Um, but we have to use it, and hardly anyone does. Um, does anyone here actually use annotations in their models in, in uh, Active Record? Uh, decent number, all right, that's good. Thank you. Uh, so um, I also released a couple gems actually to, uh, to let you define active record models before the uh, attributes API was a thing. Uh, one was called Virtus Active Record. Um, anyone seen this talk by Uncle Bob, Architecture of the Lost Years? Uh, a couple, anyone lucky enough to have been there? All right, one other person. I was there, I'm the person that asked him a question, can you show us some code? And he said, you have to figure it out yourself. Um, <laughs> so you can't hear me on the video. Um, so it's a seminal talk. Oddly enough, it was only given it at once at a regional conference. Um, I'm not sure why, maybe because he didn't give those details and I called him out, I don't, I don't know, probably not. Um, he doesn't usually seem affected by that. Um, since this talk, and, and probably even earlier, I've struggled to find a way to get Rails to implement all those architectural suggestions. Um, my last project, uh, we used the interactors gem um, to do the interactors part. Uh, it's actually on the, the chart there, up there, his diagram. Um, and that splits the Rails controller from the business logic. Um, according to this talk, um, the fact that our app is a web app is sort of incidental, and so we should have the business logic separate from that incidental delivery mechanism. And Interactives gives, can give us that. There's a pretty good Interactives gem, um, and it works pretty well for that part. But I've never found a great answer for splitting entities in the database, which if you look there, he's got entities on the right side, um, and then an entity database, or entity gateway in the database. Um, and this is the quest that I'll be talking about today. So after almost 10 years from that talk, Uncle Bob wrote a book on the topic called Clean Architecture. Uh, it's a pretty good book, but it really doesn't help me with this problem. It doesn't get into the details. Um, Uncle Bob also has a blog article called Clean Architecture that's got a pretty good succinct explanation. So the first stop on my quest is the SQL ORM. Um, I will not pronounce SQL as SQL because then I would get really confused. Um, so the, this is the biggest surprise when I did research for an earlier related talk. And it's written by Jeremy Evans. Does he happen to be here today? All right, no, I don't see him. Um, so he was winner of a uh, Ruby Hero Award a few years back. Um, SQL has tons of plugins and they leverage lots of database features, especially for Postgres. Uh, it supports almost any SQL database you can think of, and I really like the documentation. 
SQL has two different APIs that you can use. Um, it's got the data set and the model uh, APIs. Here's the code used to set up the SQL for the next couple of slides. Um, not a lot going on here. Pretty much just creating a table. Um, SQL syntax is really nice. Here's the data set. Look at line four. Note that the block lets you use bare column names and a greater than. Um, that's pretty cool. Active Record does not let you do that, although there is a squeal gem that adds that sort of feature. The problem is it doesn't stay synced up with Active Record as well as we'd like. Um, and I think I've run into a few other bugs and problems. Um, data sets are innumerable uh, with each element as a hash-like hash object. Uh, you can see that being used in line five. I haven't come across anything that SQL can't do well, which is pretty cool, actually. It just doesn't fit the pattern that I'm looking for. So here's a higher level API, uh, the SQL model. It's using objects instead of just a hash-like object. And you'd probably be more likely to use this layer in Rails. We, we'd like to use object-oriented programming. Like Active Record, attributes are derived from the database schema, um, but also like Active Record, relationships has to be specified manually. Again, that thing that really frustrates me. I really like SQL. I wish Active Record was more like SQL, actually. Um, but SQL doesn't solve the problem I'm trying to address. So next storm in my journey is uh, ROM, the Ruby object mapper. Um, this was originally uh, meant to implement the data, map data mapper pattern. Does anyone remember the data mapper uh, library? Anyone use it? Eh, a decent amount of people. Um, so originally this was data mapper 2. And 2013 they renamed it to ROM. And 2014 they moved away from object relation mapping altogether. So it's not really technically an ORM. It just maps the data, not the objects. Uh, most of the work is done by Peter Solnica. I'm not gonna try to pronounce it in his language. Uh, P-I-O-T-R, Peter, I believe, in English. Um, it's similar in spirit, and it's partly inspired by Elixir's Ecto. Does anyone use Ecto? All right, good number, all right. So you guys might find this a little, little more palatable than I do. Um, so, um, let's see. Peter Solnica also formally wrote Virtus, a really nice attribute declaration library. Um, ROM is a bit complex to use. It has commands, relations, mappers, and you have to buy into this completely different paradigm and mindset. Uh, ROM's developers are responsible for the dry RB libraries, which we'll actually talk about a little more. Uh, it's really good at small, independent, low-level, composable libraries. Uh, some of the leaders of this movement towards functional programming and immutability in Ruby are, are part of this dry RB and, and the ROM team. I, I find them a bit focused on the load level details too much, and I think that's why it takes them a long time uh, to get their product out. But once it's out, it's really high quality code. Um, so ROM relation, this looks pretty straightforward, and um, we've got... Uh, We've got a, a, a model class called user that's, that's empty, and then we've got a users class, which is a ROM relation, and we uh, define the attributes there in a schema block, and then we have the associations in, in a sub-block of that. I, I kind of like that, that's nice. Uh, and then I've defined a, uh, basically what's a scope in there. Um, we could also tell ROM to pull the schema from the database. We would replace the schema block with a schema infer true. Um, but then we wouldn't see all the attributes, and it seems like this is the preferred way showing all the attributes in, in this, this declaration. Uh, to save an object, we start with the relation. We, we new up a relation object. Uh, we pass that to a change set. If you know Ecto, this feels really familiar. Uh, and that includes a create or an update. I don't know what happens if you get it wrong. And it passes all the attributes as a hash. So, like I said, we're not really dealing with objects. You'd have to you know, do your object to hash if you're dealing with a, a, a Ruby object. Um, and then we have to explicitly commit the changes. I think that might be nice, I'm not sure. So I found ROM to be really complex. Here's an overview diagram of, of, of their uh, architecture. Honestly, I can't follow everything that's going on there. Um, so I found that confusing. I really wanna like ROM, 
uh, but I found it too complex and confusing. I couldn't actually get things set up right to run the code that I showed you in those previous examples. So the last of my quest is the model layer of Hanami. Hanami is a full uh, web framework and alternative to Rails. I have liked everything I've seen. If, if I had a choice, I'd probably choose, uh, choose Hanami instead of Rails at this point just to try some side projects. So Hanami supports SQL, uh, actually via SQL, uh, memory and file adapters. It follows the data-driven design architecture. I'll talk about that a little bit more. So it has entities which are models without persistence or validations. It's got a repository, which is mostly like the class methods in Active Record model classes. So things like create, update, persist, delete, or all find first and last. Uh, it's got a mapper, which is a declaration of how to map between database records and object attributes. Here's the first part of a Hanami model. So we inherit from Hanami entity, uh, which surprisingly adds only four methods, at least the last time I looked. It adds ID, ID equals, initialize, and then a class method called attributes that, that we're using there. And that's all it adds. That's pretty cool. Uh, the default initializer takes a hash of attributes uh, to set all the entity, entities' attributes. Uh, and types come from the, the dry types library. So that types colon colon int, types colon colon string, those are dry types. Uh, we could, again, let the model pull the schema from the database like active record. Um, but I don't think that's that common. So persistence is done by the repository class. Note that things like where and order here are private. We can only use them within that query there on line uh, three. Uh, queries are analog analogous to, to scopes in Active Record. And here we're using it. We knew up a, an article from the article repository. Uh, we grade it, and then we, we can go find it and uh, find, it, find by author. So I think Hanami is my favorite Ruby ORM. If I had a choice, I'd probably use it in Rails. Uh, but it's not a very realistic option, as far as I can tell. It requires everyone on your team to learn something new. If it's just you, that's not a big deal. If we have a team of, uh, I think if we have eight developers on my team, probably not going to work. Also, probably don't want to use it on a project that already has hundreds of models that's been around for, uh, I think, eight or ten years. Um, so uh, there's not much documentation on using it with Rails. Uh, nor with the, the other ORMs I talked about. And Rails add-ons assume you're using Active Record most of the time, and they may or may not work with another ORM. So Hanami model implements the repository pattern. And the repository pattern represents a, col a collection of domain objects. And in a lot of ways, we can, create, create, we can treat the database as an in-memory collection. We can kind of abstract that even more than we do with Active Record. Um, we do have something similar in Active Record, and that's the class methods. The create, the where, the find all. And when you create a scope, that's basically also sort of the repository pattern. But again, it's stuck in that, uh, in, in class methods. And, and those have some serious limitations. Um, it leaves a procedural code instead of object-oriented code. Uh, it often indicates that you've missed an abstraction. It limits your polymorphism, and it's hard to test and hard to refactor. There's a good article on Code Climate that talks about all the problems with class methods. Uh, and if you uh, pull up the, uh, the talk here and the presenter notes, it, there's a link to it. So here's uh, the UML class diagram for the repository pattern. Note the arrows. The domain model is not dependent on anything. There's a clear separation of concerns. The domain model class handles the business logic. The repository class handles the persistence. Um, so we could actually end up with uh, more than one repository for a given model. Maybe you want to do sharding. Maybe you want soft deleted things in a separate database. Maybe you want read-write segmentation. Maybe you want in-memory persistence for tests uh, that uses a different uh, database backing or maybe in-memory backing. Uh, you might see this uh, repository pattern with a third class, which would be the mapper class that handles the coercion between the database fields and the uh, object attributes. So I spent several years looking for a way to have my cake and eat it too. I want to keep using Active Record, but I want to separate my domain model from the database persistence. 
So one Saturday morning, I was in bed, staying in bed a little late, and I was thinking about it again. Don't ask. I don't, I don't know why I need to think about those things in bed. Um, but I came up with a solution that I thought could work. In Rails 3, they split out the active record, they split out active record into several modules. And I thought, oh, I can use those various modules that active record uses and, and split them into the two sides. The funny thing is, I think I misremembered that. I think it was action controller that got modularized for breaking into pieces and using, picking and choosing which pieces. Active model did get pulled out of active record, I think, at that time. Um, but I don't think they were meant to be used separately. Um, so it wasn't quite as easy to make this work as I expected. Uh, all the modules have a lot of interdependencies. Uh, and there's no real documentation on how to use each module and what their dependencies look like. Um, so, but it turned out that the domain model is just most of active model. So I ended up calling that active model entity when I originally called it active record entity. Uh, and then the repository side is most of active record. Um, so I'm going to show the difference between using standard active record and using active record repository, which is the gem I'm working on. So here's a typical active record model. This should be pretty familiar to you. Uh, we have a couple, uh, we have belongs to, has many, we have a validation, and we have a scope. And then there's some fields that we don't know about by looking at the code, unfortunately. Uh, here's the same thing using active record repository. Um, instead of subclassing, I'm including a module. Uh, this is an interesting little thing that I, a pattern that I found. Uh, the module is actually dynamically generated through the call to active record or active model entity method, so we can pass parameters. And I'll talk about that some more when I talk about the implementation. Um, uh, let's see. The module we're mixing in is active model entity. Uh, the term entity comes from Eric Evans' domain-driven design, uh, and an entity is an object that has an identity. So we could have two items with the same attributes but different IDs, and those would be considered different entities. But if we have two, same, two items of the same type that have the same ID, those would be considered the same thing. And there's actually something called an identity map in, in Active Record. Uh, the, act, the other major difference is we declare attributes here, the name and types, uh, which fixes my second biggest gripe. We still have the belongs to, we still have the has many. Um, what we don't have is the scope. Um, and if we had any instance methods, we'd, we'd have those here as well. Um, so here's the repository for that same class. Again, we're including module instead of subclassing. Again, we could pass some parameters. Uh, we could pass the model class we're working with. Uh, by default, I am taking the, the term user repository, knocking the depository off, and, and assuming it's user. Um, we could specify the database table name if it can't be derived, specify a primary key, and we could, we could specify a, a mapping of database column names to entity attribute names. And the scope is on this repository side because it deals with the entire collection, not any individual object. So here's a typical controller with Rails and Active Record. Note we tell the user model to save itself on line four, and that will return false if it failed to save. Here's the same thing with my Active Record repository gem. Only two lines have changed. Line four, we explicitly test to see if the model is valid and, and then deal with that. And then line five, we tell the repository to save the model object instead of telling the model object to save itself. Uh, there's one caveat. If you've got a uniqueness validation, that can't be determined until you hit the database. So if you do have that, you're actually going to have to uh, catch an exception on, on the save. So here's a bit of the implementation of the entity model. So I talked about that pattern, the parameterized model pattern. Unfortunately, I think this is the simplest implementation possible. Um, but basically, we create a list of modules that may vary depending on what we passed. And um, then we create a module composed of those, those modules. So you know, the, the self-composed model module, not important to understand. Um, more important just to understand that we're, we're taking several modules and we're composing them together. Uh, and this, like I said, allows us to pass parameters. Um, so um, as I said, we, I previously called that active record entity, but we're not using anything from active record, so I changed the name. You see there, we're just including and extending active model uh, modules. That's hard to say. <laughs> 
Um, so here's the repository side. Again, I'm using that same uh, parameterized module pattern, um, but I haven't implemented anything on this side yet. Um, this side is all active record, plus some custom code. Um, we're mostly making, the custom code may mostly make sure that active record still works, despite the pieces I've taken away. Uh, but it still does use most of active record, but not quite all. So we've got some helper methods to call into active record. This uh, method lets you do user colon colon repository dot save and then pass a user object. Uh, this one's a bit tricky. We have to create an active record model object temporarily to save. Uh, and then we update the entity's ID when we save uh, to let us know that the entity has been persisted. Uh, this is an implementation of active record or active model persisted question mark, which I think is required to be an active model uh, citizen uh, and for Rails to, to be able to deal with you. Um, there are quite a few challenges, uh, quite a few more than I expected, probably due to the fact that I misremembered which things got modularized. Uh, it didn't occur to me for a while how to separate the modules. It turned out the Indian side is all active model and the repository side is all active record. We're not subclassing active record base and that turned out to be really tricky. Um, I spent hours trying to fix this. Uh, Active Record uses that to figure some things out. Uh, it includes info about the connection to the database. And I also had to tell Active Record that the repository class is not an abstract class. Uh, currently, I'm fighting with Active Record and relations. I'm getting an error that doesn't seem to be related to the code I added. That makes it really hard to troubleshoot. So I still have a lot of work to do to make this usable. Please do not use this in production. <laughs> Uh, I'm not gonna use it in production. I, I'm not sure I'll even get to that point, um, but it was fun and interesting to, to learn um, that maybe I can make it. Uh, the, the main part is testing all the way the relations work, like cascading deletions, uh, loading where I have to load all the relations and map them to objects, uh, and saving in, in basically the opposite way. Um, we could do automatic, automatically create migrations because we have all the, the data we need in the model class all declared there. Um, I think the only thing I'm missing right now is, is indexing. Uh, Data Mapper actually had that option. Um, if you're into migrations, go see Matt Jasinski's talk on migrations right after this, a teammate and colleague of mine. He covers a lot of gotchas with migrations. Um, I plan to look at those gotchas if I do get to the automating uh, migrations. Uh, it's in the next time slot over in room F. Uh, so I need some help from all of you. Uh, if you're interested, please go star the repo on GitHub. Uh, so I know if people are interested, if more people are interested, the more likely I am to complete the project. Um, I'm easy to find on the internet or in person. Got the Weed Maps t-shirt on today. Um, uh, I made the repo and the talk easy to find. Uh, and I'll have links on everything on the last slide. And the links kind of link to each other. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and watching. I'd especially like to thank my coworkers who watched the previous this talk and provided some valuable feedback. If you like listening to me, I do a podcast on Agile called This Agile Life. Uh, we do it semi-sporadically. I'm not always on, um, but we have resurrected it and we are recording podcasts again. Um, a big thank you to my employer, Weed Maps, for sponsoring this talk. Uh, there's about 20 of us here. Most of us have t-shirts on. Um, and we are hiring, big time. Come see us at our booth. We'll have t-shirts. I'm not sure exactly which ones yet. Um, so the source of the presentation is uh, on GitHub in my presentations repo, easy to find. Uh, there's the link to the Active Record Repository gem. Uh, you can also find that on my GitHub page. I put it near the top. And feel free to stop me uh, by the hall, in the hall if you have any questions. <laughs> 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 <laughs>